Today we're going to take a little more of an in-depth look at the person and work of the Holy Spirit. And if there's anything that is little understood in the church, it is the working and person of the Holy Spirit. And here's, here's a, a caution that I will give you. If you think, or if I think, or you hear someone else say, I have the Holy Spirit all figured out, I can give you a 99.9% .9 chance that they are wrong. Here's why. God is infinite. We don't understand all about him. We don't understand all about Jesus the Son. We don't understand all about God the Father. And we certainly don't understand all about the Holy Spirit. There is always more to know because he is an infinite God. He has designed as who he is for us to have a, a relationship with him that will be filled with new discovery for all eternity. But here's the thing, church. We don't want to wait until heaven to discover more and more of God. We don't want to wait until heaven to taste of his presence, of his goodness, of his greatness. We want to know him more and more. And so my ultimate prayer today is that what God's word will do is that it will ignite in you and I a deeper thirst to know more of God himself. To focus in more on the person and work of Jesus Christ because actually the way to receive more of the Holy Spirit is to focus in on Jesus. That's how he has designed it. He always points us to Jesus. Well, the first thing we need to begin with, though, is we need to begin with an understanding because in some of our churches, we come from very different backgrounds here. In some of our churches, you may never hear us a sermon on the Holy Spirit. In other churches, that may be the only thing you seems like you hear a, a sermon on. But we come from very different backgrounds. And so the first thing that we need to understand is that the filling of the Holy Spirit is something that is designed for every single believer. It is a gift of God that he desires to give you and I. When we seek him, he wants to fill us with his presence. He's told us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This means that our heart is his home. It is his place where he desires to be welcomed and worshiped. If you don't take anything else away today, take that. Understand that God desires your heart, your life, your relationships, your home to be the place where he is welcomed and worshipped. If we really grab a hold of that, it will change how we think and how we live. When we come to an understanding that the eternal God, the one who created everything, has chosen to take up residency in you and me, that should just blow our minds that he loves us that much, that he's that interested in you and me. Here's the problem. We read about some of these things in the scripture and we have this natural response where, oh, that was for them. Or maybe that's for certain, certain people today, but it's only for people who've reached some level. That is a lie from the enemy who is seeking to deceive you and I to keep us from experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. When it comes to understanding the Holy Spirit, the first thing that we must do is we must battle unbelief. Oftentimes, the Holy Spirit is neglected because there are false teachings and there are misunderstandings, but that is no reason for us to neglect Him. It is to our detriment when we do so. We must recognize that this is God's plan, his, de his design, His provision for every believer. I want you to look at the beginning of um, Acts chapter 2, and we're going to put this up on the screen. Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 1, and here's what it says. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were, and what's the next word? All. How many of them were together? All, okay, every believer up until that point was gathered together in one place, 120 believers. So it was the 12 disciples and um, whatever the math is that adds up to 120, 10 times more because um, I can't do the math in my head. So there were all gathered together and here's what happened. 
They're in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all, uh, how many of them were? All. all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the first thing we need to grab a hold of is this is something God has designed for every believer. Every single believer is designed to be filled. Now, what that looks like in each and every person's case will not necessarily be the same because oftentimes when we, we do this, we jump to the gifts, which are expressions. They are workings of the Holy Spirit, but it is not the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling is His presence within us. And so we have to battle the unbelief that this isn't something for me. This is something God has for you and I, for every believer. All who have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior have the Holy Spirit, but not all are always filled with His presence. In fact, most of us aren't always filled because we leak, we sin, we fail, we rebel, and His presence diminishes His active presence within us, and we need to be filled again. Also, there are times when the Holy Spirit works through us and we are, He is poured out and we need to be refilled, we need to be renewed. Not because of sin, but because He's actually working in the midst of us. Every believer receives the gift of the Holy Spirit when they are born again. The active presence, which is the filling and power of the Holy Spirit's fullness, is given to every believer who truly seeks to be filled. Understand those things work together. At least some of the disciples, before this passage that we just read in Acts chapter 2, at least some of them already had the Holy Spirit living within them. Let me show it to you in John. So turn over in your Bibles to John chapter 20. This is before this event that we see in Acts here in Jerusalem. Jesus is with his disciples, most of them, uh, but not all of them. And um, he has been teaching them how the scriptures point to him. The Bible tells us that he took 40 days to show them from every part of the scripture, from the, the Torah, which is the law, from the writings, which are the prophets, from the, the poetical books, um, how they all point to Jesus Christ, to his identity and God's plan through him. And then they're gathered together and Jesus says this in verse 21 of John chapter 20. Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now what happened? What was, what, what was occurring right here? Well, I believe Paul picks up on this event right here um, that happened in the life of the disciples and happens in the life of every other believer when we come to trust Jesus Christ as Savior and he comments on it in Ephesians chapter 1. He says this, In him, which is in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So Paul is, is unpacking what happened here in the book of John as he's writing about it. And he tells us that every single believer, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and desire to follow him as Lord, you have the sealing, the presence, at least upon you, protecting you, surrounding you of the Holy Spirit. Every believer. It's not based upon how good you are. It's not based on how much you know. It's based on the fact that you've put your trust in Jesus Christ and he has given you the gift of his presence through the Holy Spirit. That's pretty cool. It's, it's amazing. So the disciples were sealed with the Holy Spirit at this time. Um, but they would be filled in a way that enabled God's plan and purpose and work to be done in a greater way at Pentecost, what we read about in Acts chapter 2. Now what's interesting here is that Jesus, when he does this, he breathes on them. And, and, and what's so amazing is that both in Hebrew and Greek, the word for breath and the word for spirit are very, very similar. 
Jesus breathes upon them. He breathes out, and it's, it's a reminder that the work of the Holy Spirit in many ways is like oxygen. When we breathe in air, we breathe in oxygen, and it goes into our blood just as Jesus Christ gives us life. He create us, created us, and he alone saves us. It's all his honor and glory. But it is the work of the Holy Spirit that fills us with joy, with strength, and with abundant life. His working is unseen, but his presence becomes evident in the production of spiritual life in us and through us. And likewise, in a similar way, oxygen is something that, that we don't see. I mean, unless you get a tank that says oxygen on it, and then you know, okay, there's just oxygen concentrated in that tank. You can't see, at least I can't, um, the oxygen molecules in the air. I don't think any of us can do that. But they're there. And we breathe in air, and our lungs absorb the oxygen, and then it's transferred into our blood and pumped by our heart to every part of our body. That's a picture of what the Holy Spirit wants to do in the church. One of the things that I want you to remember more than anything is this. That idea where it says they were all gathered together, God's design for his church is for every member of his church to be filled with the presence and power of his Holy Spirit because you are part of his plan to show the greatness of who he is to every nation on the face of the earth. He has chosen you and desires for you to be filled with himself. One of the beautiful things, though, about in this comparison between oxygen and the Holy Spirit is when you breathe in air and you absorb part of that oxygen, you still breathe back out oxygen, right? You don't absorb all of it. It goes back out. That's why you can do mouth-to-mouth resuscitation or CPR and you can put oxygen into another person who stopped breathing. The same thing happens spiritually. When you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit, it is designed so that he comes in, he renews us, but he blesses others. Because you see, the focus of the Holy Spirit is always outward. It's never about us The Holy Spirit himself always points to Jesus. He never points to himself. He gives us an example to follow, to understand that God fills us to bless others. Now, we benefit in the process. We benefit with the blessing of his presence, of his joy, and of participating in his work. But we're not to seek just the benefit. We're to seek to be the blessing because that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's the pattern that we are to follow. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives spiritual life and we are as dependent upon him spiritually as we are physically for oxygen. In his prayer earlier, Job mentioned how no one comes to to the Father except that he draw him through the Holy Spirit. None of us were saved because we had knowledge and understanding. We were saved because the Holy Spirit drew us to him, to understand who Jesus is and what he has done. We are dependent upon him. That is why we want to breathe deep and ask the Lord to fill us with this Holy Spirit because we need him. We individually need him. The church needs him. Our world needs the church to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order for us to accomplish God's work. Now, the disciples were not strangers to the person and work of the Holy Spirit, even though it wasn't until later on that Jesus breathed on them and gave them that gift, they saw the work of the Holy Spirit continually through the work and ministry of Jesus Christ. They experienced something of the power of the Spirit as they stepped out and served God as well. The Spirit went with them. He enabled them to do the things that they did. When they were able to, um, to preach the gospel or to cast out demons, it was the work of the Holy Spirit through them. They were following the same example of Jesus. And the disciples had heard Jesus' promise of the coming and work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 18, and then in chapter 16. The disciples heard Jesus command them to wait for the promised coming of the Holy Spirit. And that's incredibly key. Because today, what I'm I'm hoping will happen is I'm hoping that you and I will be asking 
for the Holy Spirit, but understand that part of the way faith works in our life is waiting. You see, the disciples had to wait the 10 days from when Jesus ascended to the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I believe God had good reason for that. One of them was that they needed to recognize how powerless they were on their own. They needed to sense the depth of their need. Because sometimes the most dangerous thing that we can do is attempt to do spiritual things in human strength. When we attempt to do spiritual things in human strength, we will almost always lead people astray. We need to be careful. So the disciples had heard them, Jesus command them to wait. And here's why we need to be filled. Here are maybe some things to, to write down and think about. We need to be filled and refilled again and again because the Holy Spirit convicts and draws unbelievers to know Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells and influences all believers. The Holy Spirit teaches us truth from God's word and how we are to live it. If God's word is confusing, then what we need to do is ask the Holy Spirit to help us to understand. And he may do that also through, through reading and through insight that we have in other books, as well as asking questions of other believers. The Holy Spirit transforms us. This is his primary work, is to make us more like Jesus. God's will for your life and my life is that we be conformed to Jesus' likeness. And it is the Holy Spirit who is the forerunner in doing that work in us and through us. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to obey. This is why you can't fight disobedience. You can't fight sin in human strength. We need the Holy Spirit. He's the one that changes our desires. He's the one that transforms us so that we're no longer looking at this life with selfish eyes, but we're looking at this life and our relationships and everything around us from God's viewpoint. The Holy Spirit unifies believers as one in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit gives life to the believer. Here's how Jesus said it in John chapter 7. This takes place at a beautiful th time. In, in John chapter 7, Verse 37, it says, on the last day of the feast, the great day, this feast that is recurring, referring to is the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles, um, if we were to put it in English, it would be the Feast of Tents. It would be the Feast of Camping, okay? It, that's, that's literally what it means. But the idea of the Feast of Tabernacles, of camping, was that God came down and dwelled with his people. And so they would move out of their houses and they would spend time in these tents that they would erect. And they still do this uh, to this day in Israel and tabernacles. And they would, it was a picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness where God came down to dwell with them. Here's what he says. In that setting, with that imagery all around him, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now that imagery, if, if we were to, to take a study on the Feast of Tabernacle, we would see how important it is. Because one of the celebrations that you have at the Feast of Tabernacles is a ceremonial pouring out of living water. It's a reminder of how Jesus Christ, the rock in the wilderness, supernaturally gave water to the children of Israel in the wilderness. And Jesus is taking that imagery and saying, just like I miraculously provided drinking water for the children of Israel in the wilderness, when you come to me, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit and he is going to create in you a spring of living water that flows out, that gives you life and refreshment and touches and blesses the life of everyone around you. It's a metaphor, a symbol for the abundant life and joy that God desires to give us because the Holy Spirit is the fountain of spiritual life. This is also why we're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. When we do, God is not honored and we suffer. 
You see, the truth is sin, our selfishness, our own agenda, our pride robs us of life and joy. And if we're not experiencing joy, the first place we need to look is to see if there's something hindering our relationship between us and God or between us and others. Because because understand, the Holy Spirit in you is the same as the Holy Spirit in me. And if we're not getting along, if there's conflict with us, then God's children are not unified in the way that the Holy Spirit designs for us to be. That's why it grieves his heart. It's possible that we've bruised our relationship with the Lord. Also, the Holy Spirit does something incredible. I want, you to, I want you to see this from the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. The same imagery the prophet Ezekiel uses. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone, that selfish, sinful heart from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit, this is the Holy Spirit, within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to obey God. And that's why I say when when we're struggling when we're struggling with sin, when we're struggling with disobedience, part of our prayer needs to be, Lord, I give myself to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit because I can't obey you in my own strength. I can't do it in my own power. I've been trying and I keep failing. Especially if you're wrestling with an area of habitual sin where it seems like you just keep getting pushed down. You're victorious for a day or two and then... Bam, it comes right back. It doesn't matter what kind of, of sin it is. It could be anger or lust or, or pride or greed or any of those things. If we're wrestling with it, we need to recognize that we need God to do a work in us. We need more of his Holy Spirit to enable us to obey. He enables obedience. Jesus told us that it was to our advantage that he goes away. Because if he goes away, he would send the Holy Spirit. And here's why. This is, this is a powerful truth. I hope you come to understand it. The transformation of the Holy Spirit. For the disciples and for every believer, instead of an outward Jesus that is near them, they now had an inward presence of Jesus in the person of the Holy Spirit, breathing his life through them. That's what he's offering us. But for that to be a reality, our heart's desire is is not necessarily to have more power, not to have a, a spiritual experience, but to desire to know more and more of Jesus Christ. He is the focal point. And the more we desire Him, the more He will communicate to us through His Holy Spirit, His heart, His will, His desires. It's all about Him. So what does this lead us to? How do we walk in step with the Holy Spirit? Because that's, that's the focus that I want to do today. And I want to give you a few steps that we'll, we'll look at part of them today and we'll finish up next week. But here are some of the steps. First of all, we need to have a desire to be filled. And that desire believes, begins with believing that we are supposed to be filled, that we can be filled, that we're not somehow outside of, the, of God's arms and what he designs for us. Understand, though, in that desire, and we're going to look at this specifically, God only fills that which is already empty. If we're already full of something else, don't expect God to push everything else out to force his way in. He won't do that in our lives. Secondly, the direction of our life must point to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit always points us and others to the person and work of Jesus. That's what he tells us. That's the promise we've looked at over the last couple of weeks in John chapter 16. 
He will take what is mine and reveal it to you. The Holy Spirit always points us, not to himself, not to an experience, but to Jesus. And that brings us to the third step, which is denying self as Jesus denied himself for us. The fourth step is a dependence fully on God and not on our own strength. And then we need to recognize this is something that God has designed for us. If we're truly to live dependent, it's a daily action. We daily need to be refilled. That's why he even teaches us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. That's not just about physical bread. It's also about the bread of life, God's word, and the Holy Spirit. We need it every single day or we'll become spiritually malnourished. Our devotion needs to be motivated by a love for God with all that we are. And our delight is to learn to delight in that which delights God. And what delights God? You. Other people. When blessing others, when loving others becomes our delight, our heart will be unified and we're able to truly love God with all that we are. Because that's what God does. We're gonna unpack some of these here in a bit. And then um, finally, discernment. We need to be aware that the enemy is a prowling lion seeking to devour and deceive even followers of Jesus. He wants to cause confusion in this area and unfortunately he's been way too successful. And I, can, I stand here confessing before you there is so min- little about this that I understand. But step by step the Lord teaches me through his word and he'll teach you through his word more and more how the Holy Spirit works in our life. So it begins with um, a desire to be filled. We are invited, in fact, to ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. After he gives a, a parable, he says this, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So it begins with a desire. Have you ever asked the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit? If not, that's the place to begin. Say, Lord, I don't understand how this works. I I have lots of questions. Um, But you said, you promised that if we ask the Father, he'll give me the Holy Spirit. He'll fill me with the Holy Spirit. So I'm gonna do what you've said. I'm gonna ask to be filled. If we don't believe that we will be filled or that we can be filled, then our unbelief is going to block us from being filled with his presence. That desire to be filled is not a desire to seek an experience for itself. It's a desire to know more of the infinite God. That's its purpose. You see, The psalmist says, one thing I've asked and this I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever and to gaze upon his beauty. That's why we're filled with the Holy Spirit. That has to be the motivation of our heart is to see the greatness, beauty, and glory of God more vividly personally so we can show it more beautifully to others. That's the calling. That's the desire that we're to ask. And and that's why the direction of our life has to point towards Jesus. Here's what he said. Again, John 16, 14, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit never puts us on a pedestal. He never puts himself on a pedestal. He always lifts up Jesus Christ. That's our calling as well. He always points to the Lord Jesus. And the deep work of the Holy Spirit is to shift the direction of your life and my life so that we see more of Jesus and we show more of Jesus to others. Therefore, people will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. It's always outward focused. Therefore, in order for that to to happen, We have to deny ourselves. This is what Jesus taught us in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. 
For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. This is exactly what Jesus himself did. This is what he modeled. The king of the universe, the creator of everything, humbled himself. He denied his rightful position and humbled himself to take on human form, was born at Bethlehem as a frail, helpless child. And he lived and experienced the full human experience with all of its pain, with all of its suffering, and even greater because he took on your sin and my sin, the God of the universe humbled himself, denied himself for you and I, took up our cross, not his, because he didn't, he didn't need to die. So he took up our cross to gain our lives. And we are called to follow his example. That's why he commands us to follow after him, to do the same thing. And so understanding that central to the, to the filling of the Holy Spirit is a surrender of control. Lord, your will be done, not mine. If we're seeking our will and we're asking to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we want to get what we want, we're actually working against the Holy Spirit. We need to surrender and say, Lord, your will be done. Whatever it is you have, whether it's blessing and bounty or whether it's difficulty and suffering and trial that will glorify your name because that's the focal point that will bring you honor, that's what I'm seeking. That's why this is what we see here in in kind of the pivotal verse that talks about the filling of the Holy Spirit is found And it focuses around, ultimately around surrender and control. And we see it here in Ephesians chapter 5. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery or riotous, your translation may say, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now Paul uses this as a metaphor to, to help us understand how the Holy Spirit works within us, some of the benefits and blessings of the Holy Spirit, but also to point ultimately to how he has to be the one in charge, the one in control. So he uses this, this comparison and contrast because he wants you and I to experience the pure wine of the Holy Spirit. A friend um, a week or so ago gave me a bottle of wine. And, uh, and I will confess to you, I know that much about wine. Would you like to know the full extent of my wine knowledge? I know it comes in different colors. Okay, that's pretty much, I think this one's red. I can't really tell, but I think it's red because the label up, the, this thing's red. So I'm guessing it, it, it might be red. All right, but I really like this bottle of wine because it says pure. It's pure wine, all right? Well, I don't know how pure this wine from Argentina is. It, I'm sure it's, oh, it's 100% unoaked. Does anybody know what that means? Great. Tell me afterwards, because I need to know. It sounds like it's really good. I'm guessing it, they took it out of the barrel. I don't know what that means. Okay, but it's pure, okay? What, he, what Paul is pointing to, he says, I have something even more pure than the best wine, and that's the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that brings joy. The idea behind wine, even in Proverbs, it talks about how wine can gladden the heart. Now, it only does it temporarily and only for a little while, but the Holy Spirit brings a lasting joy. In the same way, wine, so I've told, when you have a little too much of it, it makes you bold. And sometimes you say things that you would not normally say. So I've been told. Um, That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us a, a pure boldness so that we can speak in circumstances and in situations where we would normally be timid. He prompts us to be able to share with others around us and gives us a pure, holy boldness that's not offensive, that's not confrontational, but that is loving. A loving boldness that reaches out and listens and wants to know where the other person is. And the Holy Spirit brings satisfaction 
See, the problem with, with drink or any kind of substance that we might use to try to find escape is that it never brings satisfaction. It never truly quenches our thirst because we thirst again. But God's presence in our life brings a lasting satisfaction. But the ultimate understanding of, of this verse of do not be drunk with wine for that is riotous but be filled with the Holy Spirit is an issue of control. Because when a person is drunk with wine or with some other substance, they're no longer the one in control of how they act. And so the Apostle Paul is using that as a, as a contrast and saying just as um, alcohol can take over a person when they have too much, when you surrender your life to the Holy Spirit, he will do what you cannot do. He will empower you to do his purpose, his will, to show forth his goodness and his greatness. But in order for that to happen, we have to release control. We have to surrender and say, Lord, my life is yours, every single area of it. Show me anything that I'm holding on to because I don't want to be stubborn. I I don't want to be selfish. I don't want this, my agenda to be about me. And so I give you my dreams. I give you all that I am and all that I'll ever be Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because here's what happens. I'm going I'm to put a little video that I found from 1912. I've used this uh, illustration before, but this video does it a little bit better. Uh, it, it's it's going to be up there on the screen. There's no sound. Don't worry. It's from 1912. It was a silent movie. And, uh, and it'll have some, some uh, words up there. And it's also in French. So if French is your language, you're blessed. Um, because the English that's up there, I don't even understand what some of the words are, and I'm a native English speaker. So let's play the, the monkey clip. Hunting monkeys. I hope this will be a great illustration. In order to capture monkeys alive, the natives employ a strategy which consists of putting fruit inside of a gourd, or they call it a kabalash, I think it is. So that's what he's doing here. He's putting some fruit inside this gourd, and then... He will put it in a place where monkeys happen to go. Makes sense? So in this case, he puts it on this tree and he ties the gourd to the tree. Honestly, you look at that and you go, that's not a very good trap. But watch what happens to the monkey. All right, the monkey sees the gourd. He smells the fruit that's inside of that. He puts his hand in there. He reaches down and he grabs it. And from that moment on, he's caught. Because He is unwilling to let go of his prize, of what he wants in order to be free. All he has to do is open his hand and he's free. But he won't do it. Now, you look at him and and I love that. Oh, so it's... it's, But that's us. Our dream. Yeah, I love that. His stupidity, yes. Won't allow him to let go. And so they can just walk up to him and take him right off the tree. His free, yeah, I love it. No one will remember anything I say in the sermon, but they'll remember, oh, that poor monkey. (laughs) All right, we could, you can stop it now, but that's that's a picture of us that happens to us spiritually. We have a tendency to grab a hold of our wants, our dreams. And we, because we won't let go of them, God doesn't fill us with more of himself. Because God's not going to force you or I to receive his presence or his blessing. It requires surrender. It requires us to humble ourselves to the point where we say, Lord, I give you everything that I am all that I'll ever be, your will be done. I ask as I do that, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit, with your presence, so that I may do your will and bring you glory. That's what he invites us to do. And when he comes in us, when he fills us, what does it look like? 
Well, the Holy Spirit, we, we often see um, the description of the, of the presence of the Holy Spirit. We see it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, in the fruits of the Spirit. And I'll read that here in just a second. But as I read it, recognize this is also a description of the Holy Spirit himself. This is what he's like. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh and its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So he's saying, in order for you to receive these things, my presence that looks like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and faithfulness, in order to have that, you've got to let go of what you're holding on to. And maybe that's where some of us are today. You're just like that monkey holding on to your will, to your want. And God is saying, would you just let go? I want to set you free. I want to set you free so that you're not enslaved to your desires like that monkey was enslaved because his hand was captured inside that gourd. I want to set you free so I can fill you with myself. The presence of the Holy Spirit gives us those things and produces those things through us so that we can be deeper in union with him. And it requires us to surrender and to be dependent upon him. I'm going to finish the rest of this next week, but let me... Let me give you some of the steps, some of the things that are involved in being filled with the Holy Spirit. How a follower of Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. First of all, we need to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior and choose to follow Him as Lord. And we need to believe that He desires to fill you and I. Secondly, we need to confess and turn from our sin. And this is something that we have to do frequently because our nature works against us, our selfishness. Then we need to recognize our need to be filled, that we can't do God's work in physical strength. We can't have God's blessing and our wants, our will, where we're on the throne of our life. We need Him. And so therefore we surrender control of our life over to the Lord over to the working of the Holy Spirit and say, Lord, have your way in me. And, and the focus of our life needs to be, Lord, I want to glorify Jesus. I want him to be the king of my heart. I want everything that I do, everything that I say, every person that I encounter, I want them to see Jesus. So I'm asking you to take complete control and focus my eyes, as Hebrews says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, the completer of our faith. That's where we're to focus our gaze and our desire. And then we ask to be filled. Ask for the Lord to be filled. And with that asking, we need to be patient. We need to be faithful. God may choose to wait a while. He waited many days with the early disciples. But he filled them. With that, we need to recognize that this is a corporate thing. It's not about me. We're to pray for others to be filled, for them to experience the fullness of God's presence, of his goodness in their life, and be willing to be a witness, to proclaim the mighty works of God, because the evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit all through the Scripture points to one thing, lifting up Jesus. That's the evidence of his filling. And then we desire to truly worship God and build up believers. Those are the steps to take. Are you willing to begin a pursuit saying, Lord, I want to know you and I want to make you known. Let that be the purpose, the mission, the deepest desire of my life. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. 
Thank you for your plan. Lord, that when we stop and we think about it, the most personal act that you have done towards us is not our salvation. Our salvation was the most costly act because Jesus Christ gave his all for us. But the most personal act is that you have chosen to give everyone who trusts in Jesus Christ the Holy Spirit to live, to dwell within us. Lord, that you've reversed everything that has happened because of the curse and you desire to walk with us moment by moment to have us live in your presence. Coram Deo is the theological term. We were created to live before your face and in the giving of the Holy Spirit, you restore that gift to us. Lord, how can we say thank you for your salvation? How can we say thank you for the gift that you desire to live within us and to walk with us moment by moment? Lord, teach us to be in awe of that gift. And Lord, to seek to honor you with all that we are. Lord, I pray that you would fill each and every believer here in this room with your Holy Spirit. That they would encounter you this week and in the days ahead in a fresh way. That they would have a hunger and a desire for your word that shows them a more accurate picture of who you are and who they are in you. And then fill each one with your Holy Spirit so that their lives may overflow with love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and self-control. Have your way in us, Lord. And so, Lord, we respond corporately and say, Lord, be the king of our heart. Take control. We let go of ourselves, of our plans, of our own dreams. And we say, Lord, you are the king. May your will be done. May your glory be seen. Fill us, Lord, that we may be a blessing that shows the greatness of Jesus in the lives of others. And we pray it all in his great name. Amen.